I was six years old, maybe seven. On Sundays, Mom and Dad would take us to a white, wooden country church in Ohio. This was German country. I remember how clean the yards were and the soybean fields, lots of soybean fields. We could pick them by the handful and then steam them in hot water for a few seconds. And then we'd take our fingers and pop the soybeans hot into our mouths, all squeaky and green. The streets there in Ohio ran crisscross, and from the air you could see how they formed neat boxes across the land. The whole earth was tamed into perpendicular lines. The world has changed so much in the past 30 years. I don't know if my words can explain the simple, deep love that a child in the early 70s could have for a church. I think we're all a little more cynical now. I certainly am. So remembering how things were then feels sort of like I'm looking into someone else's life. I mean, churches. Time has taught me that churches are places where weak people are crucified and where powerful men cower when they should take action. I've seen how churches are places for fat, greedy, soft-handed men to abuse children or funnel money secretly into their bad habits. Churches encourage vulnerability, and then they stone the sincere. They are temples often full of contradiction and arrogance, where mortals make up rules out of convenience and then stamp God's name on them. I know churches now, but I didn't know them then, because I was a child. My loves were deep, and my trust was simple. This was God's home, and these were his people. Out of curiosity, I recently found my old church on the internet to see if it was like what I had remembered. I don't know if you've done this for your old school or whatever, but it's weird after 30 years to suddenly see a website pop up with images that have just been floating around in your head for decades. It was lovely. There was a tall white steeple on top, of course, and there was that warm golden brownish picture of a gentle Jesus hanging behind the baptismal. The sanctuary was full of dark wooden pews, and there were vast windows that diffused color and light like so many handfuls of thrown confetti. Looking at those pictures, all of these other images started flooding back to my mind. Obscure or random stuff, I remember swinging on these handrails in the back of the church over this large slab of concrete that was covered in astroturf. I remembered spitting watermelon seeds in the yard with a bunch of older kids and soft, big-bosomed old women who smelled like roses and who would hug me into themselves and tell me how much I'd grown. I remembered the two deacons who taught me how to swim in the lake and how they promised not to let me drown, and they didn't, but I almost did. I remembered sitting sleepily in the pews while Mom or Dad would rub my back and flipping through musty old hymnals, reading words by Charles, Charles Wesley um, or Martin Luther, old songs, my songs, the songs of my Christian heritage. In 1978, my dad used to play tennis with the pastor on the weekend. The pastor was a young guy and he was musical. This was back when it was really a big deal to record your own music and this guy made records. He was incredible. He was a guitar player and a poet, but what mattered more to me was that he was my friend. He was the kind of adult who would take the time to talk to a child and to listen. He told me a story one time about a tomato that he was growing in his garden. He said that he waited and he waited to pick it because it was this beautiful tomato. It was a beefsteak tomato, deep and red with perfect glossy skin. He would check it daily with great anticipation. He wanted to wait until it was perfect. One day, the day came that he finally wanted to go out and get this tomato, and he stuck his hand underneath it, and it was rotten on the underside, useless. He told me the story because he wanted me to understand the seriousness of hypocrisy, the importance of being a whole good tomato the value of integrity. We owned one of his records, and I used to listen to it over and over again. 
My favorite song was one that he had written called Thank You. It was a love song, thanking his wife for her love and her support. I really just loved taking the record needle and letting it fall into that little groove where that song was. There would be silence and then a couple of pops and then the music would start and I would sing along. Hearing those words gave me some sort of deep comfort. I wasn't old enough to be romantic, so it wasn't that sort of pleasure, no. It was more like stumbling into the kitchen and finding your mom and your dad hugging each other. Maybe a little embarrassing, but beneath that, it means that all is right with the world, that my foundations are secure, that the core is in place. This is how things are supposed to be. We moved back to Kentucky about the time that our pastor's divorce was finalized. I remember he had punched a hole in the wall in the parsonage before he left. And I remember that the head of the deacons, the one who taught me how to swim, left his wife for my brother's Sunday school teacher. Other than that, I just remember this deep, sick feeling like a heavy velvet curtain had been pulled back and beneath it was a tangible darkness like that moment in the Matrix when Neo realizes that the world he's always known was an illusion, but that reality is too horrible to bear. And that chapter of my faith was closed up with all of the boxes that we moved.